You are listening to Investing Matters, brought to you in association with London South East. This is the show that provides informative, educational and entertaining content from the world of investing. We do not give advice, so please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Investing Matters podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and I'm here with the award-winning fund manager, Gervais Williams, who's also a, an author and currently the head of equities at Premier Mighton. As a managing director of Mighton and one of the most sought-after prescient commentators of the City of London, Gervais has also written three books, Slow Finance 2001, The Future is Small, and Retreat of Globalisation, Anticipating a Radical Change in the Culture of Financial Markets 2006, two of which I've got here, as you can see, and I highly recommend our listeners to purchase those books. Uh, now, Gervais, you've been a, an equity portfolio manager since 1985. Your career includes five years at Throgmorton Investment Management, later, later called um, Framlington Group, three years at Thornton Investment Management, part of, of Dresdner Bank, 17 years at Gartmoor, and obviously now you're at Premier Mighton. So I want to congratulate you on your longevity, but I also want to talk about, first, if I may, your early learning from 1985 coming into the investment industry, if I may. Yeah, it's interesting, really, because I'm um, back in the 80s, actually, the investment uh, world was not perceived as a particularly exciting career. Um, it sounds strange now because obviously it's become very popular. But in those days, um, you know, markets uh, sort of gyrated around a bit, but it wasn't anything like the, the, the position where we've been for the last 30 years, where investment returns have been outstanding and, and such like. So this is really prior to globalization. And prior to globalization, uh, global growth was very patchy. Uh, many big companies, you know, they grew with inflation, but they didn't grow much beyond inflation. Uh, and people looking for investment returns needs to move beyond the mainstream companies and needs to invest in small companies. And they were a much more sort of vibrant sector in those days where most institutions had a significant weighting of small and indeed micro cap companies. Uh, it sounds strange now, but that, that's what it used to be. And so that's really the, the industry I joined really in 85 was one where smallness was already embraced alongside with bigness. Um, and what's been interesting really about the last 30 years, specifically with globalization, with the scale and the, the excitement of, of all the uh, rising markets and asset values, is how actually smallness has been missed out of uh, in the last 30 years. Uh, and, um, and why I, I think in a way it's interesting that I've, I've stuck to what I did previously. I still love doing it. It may be not the most fashionable end of the town, but it's been a, an area where you can continue to make very good returns. Uh, and it's been an area where, you know, as the cycle turns, perhaps it'll become more fashionable again in future. Indeed. I mean, you, you wrote in in this book, um, The Retreat of um, Globalisation, um, regarding supply chains. Now we're talking about those particular things, aren't we? And we're seeing the impact of energy prices, inflation, supply chains, etc., And many other factors that, basically affecting the company's retreat from globalization. If so, which companies do you, th do you see currently that are the beneficiaries of this retreat? Well, I think what, in a way, one of the ways to, to answer that question is to think about what's been the beneficiaries of globalization. Uh, it's been very much about scale. It's been very much about companies taking risks. So often perhaps companies which are growing rapidly, but investing very, very fast, you know, the equivalent of early stages of Apple and, and Amazon and those kind of things. Um, companies which perhaps have done well because financial assets have done well. So that's including various property businesses, perhaps private equity uh, and businesses which are quite involved in, in long duration bonds. You know, so we're talking not just about uh, debt, but but debt, which is long duration debt. Uh, and those areas have done best. So going forward, I think most of those areas won't do very well. So coming back to answer your question, Peter, really, we need to find areas which aren't uh, exposed to what's been doing so well in the last 30 years. Uh, and of course, small companies tick the box every time in that regard, because many of them are perfectly good companies. Uh, they, they often dominant their industries. They're nothing like the scale of Shell and BP. But most particularly, they've still got the opportunity of being immature businesses to grow when the world's not growing. Now, that's been largely irrelevant for the last 30 years. Global growth has been outstanding. Chinese growth has been sensational. Uh, asset valuations have improved as bond valuations have come uh, up and up and up. But most particularly... Um, you know, if we are getting to a more unsettled period, perhaps global growth is going to be more patchy. If uh, inflation is a bit more persistent, then maybe you're going to get involved in companies which are able to grow when the world's not growing. So, so the prime beneficiary of the change in trend, I think, is going to be smallness and small quoted companies in particular. 
Indeed. I mean, the, the stats say it all up. Um, I've got it here. Over the last 30 years, the FTSE All shares massively underperformed the S&P 500 due to its high beta stocks, high volatility stocks. When the market is rising, they're rising more. Yep. However, in your book, you stated in uh, 2004, but you stated the future is small, which is what we're talking about here. Please can you share with our listeners how you go about um, identifying these innovative companies that potentially can outperform their much larger and often overseas peers and competitors? Well, I think there's two things. The first is being starting small, uh, it's easier to double. I know that sounds like a sort of simple point, but the point is when you're the size of Apple, you know, and, and Apple has doubled in the last few years. So, you know, it, you can still double as a very large companies too, but it gets harder. The law of large numbers gets harder. That doesn't mean it's easy for small companies to double, but it does mean there's more potential for them to double. And sometimes they double and then double again and then double again. And, and that's where Apple came from. So specifically, I think smallness has the advantage that you've got numbers on your side without saying anything else. The, the second feature is so many of these companies are very overlooked institutionally because they're relatively illiquid. They don't tend to trade very often. The institutions don't think they can get very large amounts of capital to work in individual companies. Their share prices can be more out of line with the prospects, which means that if you choose a winner, if you get involved in a company which is you know, well positioned for the future, which ultimately succeeds, um, then it's not just the case that you know perhaps it gets bigger and, and, and succeeds, but as it gets bigger, it becomes more interesting to a wider range of institutions and they chase it on. And so the valuation improves as well as the earnings. And you get this kind of tailwind where the valuations can improve and the share prices can improve and, and you can get you know, very, very good returns out of that. So, so coming back to specifically your question, how do you choose them? We, we just tend to meet all large numbers of companies. Um, the ones which are outstanding aren't actually that difficult to pick out. It, it, it's not that difficult. It's just a, ma a matter of getting around and seeing a very large number of management teams. And hopefully if we're lucky enough to meet a few outstanding management teams, then that's a way which allows us not just to build portfolios, but actually to diversify risk across a range of different holdings um, so that uh, it's sort of relatively consistent, the return. It's not going to be every year, but, but it, it, it means that long term, hopefully, that the prospects are, are, are in your favour and you've got the tailwinds working for you. Brilliant. Now, it's noted, and I see it often in, in bits of research, that fund managers, private equity firms and investment bankers often look to value companies using their own bespoke discounted cash flow models, as this values the business based on their future cash flow. Hence, so many unloved companies, as you've spoken about there, often spike in value and that predatory large premium takeovers and merger approaches are launched. Gervais, please could you explain to our listeners how you go about assessing the DCF of a potential investee company? Well, well, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Peter, but I don't use DCFs very much, uh, discounted oh, cash flow. Oh, models. wow. OK. So so the, the problem is with those is that, you know, you make an assumption in the next five or maybe 10 years and you do get, you know, some very good mathematics and, and, and some good ideas as to what the ultimate value might be. But, but, but what, just look at the last 10 years and what's happened in the last 10 years. You know, the world isn't a consistent place. You know, in the last 10 years, we've not just had the pandemic. We've had the Ukrainian conflict. We've had all sorts of uncertainties along the way in terms of interest rate rises and inflation. So from that point of view, just assuming the world's going to be the same is not a good place to start, in my view. Where you need to start is the business needs to be robust in its own uh, uh, marketplace, which means that all being well, Hopefully you're not going to lose a lot of money as a starting point. You know, the business is a relatively safe business. Perhaps it's generating some cash. Perhaps it's got a, a strong uh, group of clients in, in, in a relatively defendable market position. So, so as a starting point, that's where we start, which is we want a business where even if things don't turn out as we expect going forward, it's still a relatively robust business. And then the second feature is we're really interested in cash, not so much in terms of earnings or, or, or or different IFRS uh, standards, or, or even EBITDA and, and, and all those kind of things, just tell us about the cash you're going to generate. And many of these businesses which are listed on the market have been investing hard. Uh, sometimes they're getting to the end of a period of investment where perhaps the cap in, uh, capital investment needs to be less substantial going forward, but all the benefits of all the previous CapEx are coming through. And you get into a period where you generate not just cash, but surplus cash and plenty of it. And if you are lucky enough to pick a company out which actually has these characteristics, then it doesn't really matter whether the market's going up or much. 
very much. It doesn't really matter if you get an uncertainty because of a global recession or perhaps a, a setback in terms of local politics. Ultimately, a company generating surplus cash is in a position to generate a very good return. And if it can't do so because the share price hasn't gone up, well, it can buy back some shares or it can pay dividends or it can acquire some assets, ex enlarge its business, invest harder with the cash flow in, in scaling up their business. They have so many options to them, but the secret is to have the cash in the first place. So picking out companies which are generating significant cash in the next two or three years is pretty much the, the, the main process we go for in terms of selecting winners for the future. Fantastic. I love that. Thank you very much. Now, part of any successful um, of being a successful fund manager or investor is learning over the years what to avoid also, um, Gervais. So given your vast experience, what are the the amber and red flags that you're looking to avoid when you're screening the small cap companies that you're looking for? Well, there are two or three. I mean, the first is um, we do meet quite a lot of management teams who have done very well over the years. But, but there is a real danger that if you have a, a good run of uh, in success, that, that some management teams become a little overconfident. And, and when they're overconfident, they tend to be uh, perhaps uh, uh, underestimate risk. Uh, so specifically, uh, so anything moving towards arrogance or, 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 or perhaps uh, underestimating uh, the future risks is an absolute red light for us. We are very, very cautious of management teams who, who are overconfident. The second feature is that you can have a business which is successful and, and between now and say a, a couple of years time, the business goes on to be really, really successful. But between now and then something awful happens, not just a pandemic, but, but perhaps a big setback, a, a global recession, whatever it is. And if you've got a business which has got too much debt, then it's not so much whether it's succeeding in two years time, it's whether it's going to stay alive for now. And businesses which get into financial difficulty, it's not so much just their share prices go down. Of course, a lot of our share prices don't just go up politely. They, they zig and zag along the way. But if they go down and then they need emergency funding along the way, then you find that you can actually end up diluting uh, many of the long term returns. And that very much happened to the banks, say, in 2008, 2009. Lots of banks had extra uh, share issuance and the share prices of many of the banks in the UK, indeed around the world, are never going to get anywhere near to where they were prior to. 2008 because they've issued so many shares at such a low level that actually the upside is, is heavily diluted in a permanent way so so again we want to avoid companies with too much debt and we're very sensitive on debt we're not against debt entirely but we really want very small amounts of it and plenty of headroom for that and the third element is very much valuation you know we're all emotional we get very excited about companies we, we, we think about their success and the opportunity and the scale of the bus business which might be in the next few years and perhaps we sometimes get so enthusiastic with the share price rising up and there's good notes and good announcements from the company that we end up overpaying. And I think overpaying is another feature which actually can end up, uh, you know, you still got a successful company, but because you've overpaid to start with, you never get quite the commercial return that you expected. Uh, and that's quite disappointing. Clearly, if you do are unlucky enough to, to pick a, a, a company which actually has a problem, then overpaying at the start means that actually you end up with big capital loss as well. So, so those are the three areas we're very, very cautious about. Overconfident management teams, balance sheets which are too uh, stretched, and most particularly valuation. Indeed, indeed, I, I agree with that. I want to go back, if I may, on, on part of what you said there. I'm, I'm using this quote because you've been quoted as saying, avoid companies overburdened with debt and it is likened to a poison. <laughs> For the benefit of our listeners, please can you expand a little bit more on that and the importance of looking really at the regular occurrences of diluted fundraisings, placing, and at worst, which we've had a, of late, um, delistings of some companies. Yes, I mean, the trouble is with the world is that, um, uh, you know, it zigs and zags all the time. So, uh, you can feel that you've got a successful company uh, it, it, and, and it may be that it does you know, need extra capital to get to the finishing post, which is absolutely fine. And it may be that you feel it's a good thing to, to, to get involved in, in putting extra cash into the company. But it, it's no good just to be one shareholder doing that. You need to have a, a body of shareholders around you who also have the same view. Uh, and if you've got a, a, a shareholding group, perhaps who, who aren't confident or perhaps the, 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 the momentum in the market is very against you, uh, it doesn't matter what you think, you can find actually that the price and, 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 the, and the issuance cost uh, is, is so dilutive that actually, in spite of the fact that you may have been right in technical terms over the three-year period, you end up actually costing yourself a, a lot of money. So, so coming back to this issue of poison, debt in itself 
it is very different from capital. Capital, you know, you have it and it goes up and down a bit, but you never have to repay it long term. You may have to pay dividends to, to raise more capital, but most particularly, it, it's a very long term, open ended liability. The problem with debt is it's very specific. You have to pay certain interest payments every year. Uh, and most particularly, you have to repay the whole debt at a certain time in the, in the future. Uh, and it may be just going into that period when you have to repay the whole debt, you end up actually in the middle of a global financial crisis. Or perhaps you end up with a period where uh, individual uh, prospects for some sectors, perhaps the technology sector or maybe the energy sector, have moved against you. And as a result of that, you end up just at the wrong moment having to raise cash. Uh, and you can't borrow more money because people are, are worried about it. And you end up hugely uh, reducing the upside potential for the equity. So, so that's why we call it poison. It's in danger of really um, having a very uh, adverse effect, even though all the other features, you know, the, the business and the prospects and the management team and the opportunity are still very much where you expect them to be. Along the way, those, those fixed liabilities uh, actually can catch you out in a big way. And that's why we're so sensitive to those features. Rightly so. Thank, thank you for that explanation. That takes me on to another point I wanted to ask you. Now, Gervais, you're a member of the AIM Advisory Council and a board member of, quote, of the Quoted Companies Alliance. Following the Neil Woodford slash Patient Capital Trust debacle, you were a member of the Patient Capital Review Panel with the Chancellor of the Exchequer where recommendations were put into legislation in the subsequent budget. What did the industry learn most from this episode and what has changed because of it? I think the nature of the problem uh, with Woodford, um, you know, he's clearly a very talented fund manager, had a long successful record, um, was that he was investing in companies with uh, cash flow liabilities. These were businesses which were having to invest to generate lots of long-term profit. So he was having to have the the, the confidence to be able to put capital in and more capital in to get these companies to the finishing post. And, and, and there are, you know, biotechs and other types of companies like that out there, which are very successful investments. So there's nothing wrong with that. But he was doing so in an unquoted form. So if you've got a, 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 an open ended investment company, for example, then you've got a commitment to pay to your shareholders or unit holders. Uh, every time they want their cash out, you have to kind of raise, raise some cash and sell some things. But because uh, some of these were unquoted, you could only sell the listed companies. And, 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 you know, as the listed companies go down, then the proportions of those in unquoted go up uh, and you get to regulatory problems and you get into anxiety about whether you can liquidate enough. Uh, and that's ultimately why the fund was gated. And gating isn't just uh, bad news for the investors because they can't get the cash out in the short term. But it does mean, therefore, that... Uh, the, the, the management of the, the fund changes from just you know trying to maximize return to just trying to get exits uh, and, and 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 it's been you know it's been a very unhappy outcome for those clients who happen to have the fund at the time of gating so so coming back to it all the main issue is that if you are going to invest in in unquoted companies you need to find an infrastructure a, 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 you know a, a, a sort of fund structure which is more appropriate than open-ended investment companies and that's particularly investment trusts uh, but you can use other structures as well so so coming back to our investment holdings yes we have uh, some investment trusts uh, yes we have open-ended investment companies but in general we don't have any unquoted companies at all the pr truth is we can make heaps and heaps of money over the long term uh, by investing in many of the quoted companies we don't need to make that extra little bit which you might make from unquoted so keep it simple uh, there's plenty of opportunity especially in the uk market with lots of micro caps as well as mainstream companies to invest in uh, and i think the, the the problem was the maths works against you I, I talked about the maths earlier if you've got holdings there which are unquoted and 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 the portfolio starts to get smaller and smaller because you get redemptions that problem becomes more significant and that was ultimately the, the nightmare for mr woodford you can give me that thorough reply. I really appreciate that, Gervais. Thank you. Now, many of our listeners um, love the enjoyment of picking individual stocks and funds and trusts. Please could you share with us the importance? You've touched on it a little bit there already with regards to selecting stocks with management and leadership of the highest quality. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we, we certainly want very good management teams. Um, and the great advantage of the PLC world is, of course, that this is uh, companies which are in the public arena, you get lots of data, you get lots of opportunity to meet them. Uh, even online, you may not be able to meet them in physical times other than AGMs, but, but, but you get opportunities to listen to them online and hear what they're saying. 
Uh, and the opportunity, therefore, is for you to get aligned with certain investment uh, themes, which give you an opportunity going forward. The, 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 as I mentioned very previously, the nightmare is that however good plans your management team may have, they may get disrupted by uh, the real world. As I say, un, un, unusual events, uh, uh, setbacks, uh, uh, um, uh, cash uh, problems, all of those things can turn up. Uh, and you want a management team which isn't just able to hold its own, but actually uh, is able to uh, foresee some of these problems and do their best to steer around it. So coming back to it, yes, you want a management team which are effective in terms of leadership and, and, and strategy, but ultimately you really need a management team which actually has the emotional uh, content to actually bring not just uh, their, their clients with them, but their, particularly their, their employees with them. You want the employees to be uh, sufficiently confident about the management team that they're not just happy to stay at the business, but actually they're happy to carry on and see through the problems so the business recovers. And so from that point of view, when we meet management teams, we're very, very interested in things like customer service. So if, if, if you're not really not just interested, but obsessively interested in customer service, then from that point of view, your customers might well find that actually when they when there's tough times, they may find there's other people cutting their prices. And if you're not delivering outstanding customer service, you may lose some of your customers. And the same is true for your staff. You really want your staff not just to be thrilled to working for your business, but actually engaged and confident about the future so that even when there's unsettled world out there, they're staying with your business. Uh, they're, they're continuing to look after your customers. They're continuing to deliver outstanding service. And that means that the business has a better terms of prospects. So, so coming back to management teams, we think a lot of these softer skills, rather than just the strategy, rather than just you know being, being convincing about how the numbers have come out and why they've done well, but some of the softer skills like looking after customers, looking after their staff, delivering a, a good outcome is, is very, very important ultimately because it means that they're more robust, they're more sustainable businesses in the long term. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that um, in some of your recordings regarding um, speaking about, especially like retail and consumer facing companies, you, also, you often talk about the consumer metrics and asking the, the management teams, are they aware of and what the numbers are? Can you just expand on why that's so important to ask those sort of questions? Well, what's interesting is when you meet management teams, they often have a, a, a you know, slide pack with them. We, we would have looked obviously at the annual report, maybe perhaps some broker reports prior to the meeting, perhaps online, uh, look at the business and see what they, how they portray themselves. Uh, and what's interesting about nearly all of those different met, uh, you know, sources of information about the company is how little information there is on customer service, for example. There are some companies which say, you know, our net promoter score is a kind of measure of, of, of customer outcome um, is this. So that's not impossible, but it's quite unusual. Um, certainly, there's very, very little information, often even in annual reports about, you know, not just about the staff, our staff are our most important asset is what they often say. But then you say, well, what, what, you know, how are you checking to make sure that they're having a good outcome? You know, when did you last do a staff survey? What was the outcome to the staff survey? You know, et cetera. So from that point of view, these kind of metrics have almost well, very little visibility in terms of the presentation, which they often set in front of you. Now, that's kind of interesting in itself. Now, it may be that most fund managers don't ask about this and therefore they're covering the agenda points which are covered by most other fund managers. But most particularly, as I mentioned previously, the nature of it is that a successful business is one which does look after its, its customers really well and does get uh, engagement and, and, and success in terms of the, 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 the body of the staff. So, so from that point of view, it's an interesting area to talk about, if only because many of the, many of the management teams we meet are unrehearsed. You know, they haven't got their, 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 their party line. They haven't got their little kind of metrics, which they can use in terms of the slides. They haven't got their props. So from that point of view, you actually get to hard rock very quickly, real information. And that helps, of course, identify the management teams who say they're interested in customer service, as opposed to those which are uh, actually more uh, demonstratively uh, in, interested in customer service. And, and, and that gives us huge insight, I think, into the management teams, which are hopefully going to have duration as opposed to those which may get unsettled by, by unexpected events. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And currently in the environment that we're in, it's, it's prudent to be defensive in nature, Gervais. So please can you share with our listeners how you, go, how you and your team go about assessing the best quality companies regarding recurring revenue, which obviously can offset some of the noise and the flux in, in their um, revenue streams? 
Yeah, I, I, again, I mean, it, it sort of it comes back to things like, you know, if you have got customers, you know, how how many come back again? You know, so some of those kinds of metrics. So in a way, recurring revenue is, is rather a nice, comfortable f- feature. You get lots of software businesses which charge a, a, a maintenance fee and they get that in every year. Uh, and it, it provides a nice kind of number. But, but there's quite a lot of businesses out there which actually, you know, they don't have that opportunity. They have to go and find new customers. Uh, some of their old customers come back, a construction business, perhaps Gallifrey or something. From that point of view, they've got to go and uh, not just deliver a good outcome for clients, but they've got to find other clients who are wanting to build large projects and such like. So coming back to that, yes, recurring revenue is important. But what you really need to find is a company which has got uh, the confidence to actually continue to fill the hopper with new clients, uh, even if some of your existing clients are, 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 are you know, finishing your finishing the projects for them. So we're not against that kind of thing. It's nice to have a recurring revenue, but it's it, it's it's got to be actually ultimately about the ability to fill the hopper, and that's about how how people perceive your business, uh, about uh, long term relationships. It's to do with things like uh, you know how you t- you know how you how you invest in your own business, so you're more you know have more to offer than perhaps some competitive businesses. All of these things come through because some areas like the oil industry, for example, there's there's probably you know, tens of stocks to choose from, even in the UK, let alone internationally. Uh, and so, in a way, it's it, it, there was almost too many to choose from. So you need to kind of find again the kinds of companies and the kind of ways they invest and the way they manage risk. To give you uh, the confidence that you know, even if revenues peak out with some of the current customers, maybe there's a downturn in the industry. They've still got enough momentum in terms of bringing new customers to offset that, uh, ultimately generate sales, but most particularly cover their cost base, so they don't end up in loss-making positions and ultimately running out of cash. Brilliant, love that. Right, um, I'm going to ask you this question regarding um, two stocks you currently hold in whichever portfolio you've got, or or trust or fund that you feel would thrive or will thrive during these uncertain times and potentially over the next 12 to 36 months, you know, given all the parameters that you've set regarding, you know, choosing the best companies that are out there at the moment. Yes, it's interesting. I mean, we're quite unusual in getting involved in early stage companies because in a way, um, you know, there's more uncertainty about an early stage company. On the other side, you know, often the markets they serve of an immature market are those which are, are, are early stage and therefore they're not dependent on global growth to succeed. They're, they're dependent upon the immature sector. So, so a company which uh, is well represented in many of our portfolios is a company called Sieta, S-I-A-E-T-T-A, Sieta, uh, came to market a bit over a year ago. Uh, and it's a business which is involved in electric motors. A lot of companies are involved in electric motors. They like to think there's a little bit better than others. Uh, you know, that, that's interesting because many of their customer relationships seem pretty strong. So they must feel that they, you know, those customers must feel pretty excited about it. But what's been interesting about it since it's come to market, and this is the advantage of being listed, is they've been able to move quite fast. So it's not just about the motors. They were able to take over a business called eTraction, which was a, a business which uh, uh, someone else had put a lot of money in. And, and because uh, they were running out of cash, they were able to buy it for a very, very low valuation. Uh, and that widened their range of, uh, of products from electric motors into uh, inverters and, 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 and chassis. Um, and then more recently, they've also extended their business into making more volume. And they've taken on a factory lease of a business which used to make electric motors for other uh, markets. And now uh, they can make motors. But what's been very interesting about the, the re- recent uh, announcement is the business has actually now brought in a very large uh, relationship, a company called Connet. It's a, it's a US corporation, heavily involved in, in truck uh, 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 sort of hubs uh, and could get motors in those hubs to actually drive the business ultimately. And, and, and it's the scale of the opportunity and, and, and the visibility of that opportunity, um, which has meant that the, you know, the company has not just succeeded in terms of you know, growing the business fast, but it's some of those, uh, the advantages of some of those deals they've done and, and, and the state scale of those opportunities has been just amazing. The share price has gone up. It's not gone up enormously. It's done okay at a time perhaps when other share prices has gone down. It's still quite a small business, 125 million market cap. But most particularly, what we've been amazed by and thrilled is how the scale of that market footprint 
they've been demonstrated by the quality of their customer relationships and the new customer relationships they, they brought in has built, built a business there, which is which we think is is very exciting, irrespective of whether there's a global recession coming, irrespective of whether you know, oil price goes up or down going forward. Uh, and that's the kind of business we, we all want in our portfolio, a business which has great prospects, but isn't reliant on, on things which may uh, be uncertain going forward. Another example, perhaps, is U Group. Um, U Group is a much smaller business uh, in terms of uh, it's only 30 million market cap, it's tiny. Uh, but this is a business which is involved in helping particularly uh, uh, UK quoted companies, but also some private businesses uh, buy energy. Um, they're, a, they're a supplier. So a bit like uh, Centrica, they're, they're a supplier of energy. They're not a broker. They, they actually are the supplier of energy in gas and energy and uh, electricity and such like. Uh, they've built a business which has got better customer service than many others. Uh, it's more flexible. Uh, they've, they've brought in staff. It's based around Leicester. Uh, and they've had terrific momentum. Uh, since, uh, you know, they, 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 the share price got a bit too high at one stage. They had some accounting issues. Uh, the share price came down. But the underlying momentum and the quality of the business uh, and the management team and the leadership are still very much there. They've just been through the most extraordinary stress test. Oil price, of course, energy prices, electricity prices have gone crazy. Uh, have they gone bust? No, they haven't. They've just generated more cash. Uh, and, and that's a lovely business. So, again, lots of these tiny companies, these micro caps, they're quoted. But sometimes, you know, their share prices drift, not because there's anything going wrong, but there's a small seller, no buyers. And you get these share prices moving down. And it's just amazing when you see the quality of some of these businesses, the scale of the investment that's gone into the past, the momentum for the future and the current market cap, in this case, only 30 million. Again, uh, just perfect for our kind of client base. Brilliant. You know, this is the beauty of getting into small caps early that you can participate in their profit and generate and revenue generating journey. Now, I wanted to carry on on that on that sort of vein, if I may. Please, can you share with us your greatest successful investment and telling us initially what, how you identified it and how you went about profiting and scaling out if you did uh, regarding capturing your investment returns regarding that particular investment, Gervais? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I don't know the exact one because I don't always measure how much they've gone up. But I, I know from actually writing my my first book, Slow Finance, that when I looked back, one of the one of the successful investments I had was a company called Severfield Reeve, now Severfield Rowan. Uh, it's a business which is involved in structural steelwork, very, very efficient business. What was interesting about that business wasn't so much that they were doing structural steel, but they found a way of... Uh, painting the steel and then driving the lugs in the right place and all the rest of it with less uh, lifting of the beams. Uh, and that's because they had you know, cranes above the factory, which moved the stuff around. But they also, in the factory itself, they had these very wide ranging kind of uh, uh, rail wagons. They're, they're not traditional rail wagons, but they're on railway uh, lines and they could move them up either using the crane overhead or just using the railway underneath. And, and it was that opportunity for them which meant that they could do things more efficiently than their competitors. They, they, they had less movements. They were, they were, they were quicker to turn around. Uh, there was less uh, errors as a result of, of their systems, which meant that actually they've gone on not just to have one line, but they built eventually seven lines of these up in uh, Thusk, uh, uh, where, where they are. And, 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 it's, it, you know, it, and, and, and being a very small business to start with and being an industry where there was a lot of expansion because there was a lot of you know, warehouses and different uh, shopping centers going up and all the rest of it meant that actually the business expanded enormously quickly uh, back in the uh, sort of late 90s and 2000 period uh, and so it actually the share price rose extraordinarily and it wasn't just the share price rose they paid the dividends and so you got the income and if you reinvest the income that made it even faster so extraordinary um, but but not unique there are many other companies which have gone up uh, by uh, you know more than 5 10 15 times when you look at it and and so the opportunity is very much there that just happens to be a, an, an old example i, I haven't got one right to mind now perhaps because the markets have been more unsettled maybe I, I, I don't concentrate on my successes I mainly concentrate on my my least successful companies which I, I you know mm. I worry about well we can touch on that if you want now um, with regards to your least successful companies <laughs> the mistakes and the lessons what's been the greatest one you've gone how did that go wrong you know everything you've identified was right but it still went wrong because I think as you as you pointed out Often our greatest learnings are from our mistakes or our or our errors. So, would you share an example of one for us, please, Gervais? Yeah. So, the, the, the area where I've lost money for my clients uh, quickest, most completely, uh, and most disappointingly, in terms of I didn't expect it, 
is probably in the more sophisticated companies. So if you've got a company which is a more, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's more things to think about the business model, say complicated financial, perhaps. So when you get a complicated financial wrong, it's not just that the share price goes down, but obviously if they are business perhaps involved in lending, for example, uh, it's not so much that money's gone out, but, but it can't come back again because money's gone out. So perhaps a, a current example might be Morse Group. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very good company. They, they're in home collective credit, um, but ultimately they lend money. Uh, the FCA was involved originally with Provident Financial and they were unsure about whether all the checks had been done to make sure that when people borrowed that they were, were in a position to, to, to pay back. And it wasn't good enough to just say, well, they did pay back. You actually had to go back and demonstrate it. And then all the ambulance chasing kind of claims companies came in. Um, and, 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 and we believed that Morse's group was robust in these areas. And in the end, it's turned out that, that in spite of their safety checks and, 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 and care, uh, ultimately they've been caught out as well. The, the business hasn't gone bust. Um, uh, neither did Provident Financial, but but they are having to change their business model and 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 and, and look back and, and the financial conduct authorities having a look at them. In a way, it, 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 you know, there's it's just a change in attitude really to to, to the regulator. The regulator in the past was probably more tolerant of those kind of businesses. It's less tolerant, or perhaps it went through a period of being less tolerant. I think it's becoming more tolerant again, bizarrely. Um, so from that point of view, um, it's the the complicated financials. When we get those wrong, it's not just that we lose money, it's the complexity and, of course, the, over the, the, the leverage balance sheet. Again, Morse's fortunately wasn't very levered. So from that point of view, uh, the business has survived. But, but, but it's, again, it's the complicated financials, really, where we tend to, if you want to look at the ones which we've lost most money and most quickly, it's those areas, I think. Thank you for that reply. I really appreciate that. Now, I, I wanted to touch on um, stock market ac academics. Um, Paul Marsh and Scott Evans of the London Business School, who compiled the numerous indices. And they note that small caps have historically done badly when interest rates are tightening the cycle and recessions. However, over the long term, they tend to outperform. Gervais, does this mean that you'll be buying certain shares whilst the markets are fearful and selling when some markets are doing well, when people are being greedy going forward? Yes, I mean, we obviously always looked by buying companies which we think are overlooked and, and selling companies which are already successful uh, to reinvest in other companies which are overlooked uh, on an ongoing basis. So that, that goes without. I, I, I know there are people who worry about, you know, uh, interest rate rises and, 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 and economic slowdowns and, and some of the other features which tend to, to, to worry people. I think sometimes it, you, you can be too complex. You, you look at all these different factors, you know, our interest rates going to go up or down in the next three months or six months. Perhaps we should think about that. Ultimately, the great advantage of small quoted companies is that in general, they grow a little faster than the main market. Uh, specifically, when things get really tough back in the 70s, for example, when there was a lot of companies going bust, a lot of private businesses with too much debt, unfortunately, got uh, went insolvent. As a quoted company, you had a better balance sheet. You were less likely to go bust because you had a stronger, a more robust balance sheet. But most particularly, you could keep those teams of, 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 of staff together from businesses which had gone bust because... They were viable businesses. They were just over borrowed uh, and that in indebtedness ultimately meant that they weren't safe at the time. But you could keep the business together, buy it uh, from the receivers, uh, inject a little bit of working capital and generate extra cash as a result of that business succeeding going forward. So, so coming back to this, I, I think whether interest rates are going up or down or whether the global economy is going up or down, I think in a way is a secondary issue. The main issue about small quota companies is that longer term and 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 Marsh and, and and Evans's data and indeed Elroy Dimson, who was originally involved in this, um, ultimately demonstrate that since 1955, uh, as you move down the size bands, on average, the better the performance. So if you move into mid caps, it's, it's better than the mainstream companies. Uh, if you go into small caps, it's better than mid caps, and if you go into micro caps, they tend to do even better still. And that's particularly true if you have a bias towards companies which are lowly valued. I mentioned earlier that, that one of the features you need to be careful about is overpaying for some of these companies. If you have a bias towards uh, you know lowly valued companies and smallness, uh, the, the, the both effects combine and you get extra return. So I think that's the most important feature. So rather worry about whether, you know, small caps are going to outperform this year or last year. Ultimately, try and pick a, a, a good weighting of some of those companies. And then you'll get certain spurts when it tends to perform. I mean, who would have thought with the pandemic, after the pandemic, just when we had a global recession and, and, and massive uncertainty about the global economy, that small quoted companies would have had their best period of performance for years. 
Uh, but that's what happened. You know? And it would have been very hard to pick that beforehand, but that was the outcome. So, so don't become too intellectual about it. Just look at the opportunities and spread your risks, not just in the individual small quota companies, but have other assets as well, perhaps property or house or whatever. Um, so you've got different assets which do different things at different times. And I think ultimately, yes, I mean, I think small quota companies uh, will continue to outperform. Uh, what I'm less certain about is whether the mainstream markets continue to generate the returns they've generated in the last 30 years. I think, you know, global growth is going to be more unsettled. I think we're going to be in a period where perhaps uh, margins come under pressure. Many of the big companies perhaps won't make the same profit margins they've made in the past. And I think from that point of view, we also may find that China's not growing at the same rate. It turns into a sort of Japanese type no growth economy. And if all of those things are half true or perhaps all three come back, then I think perhaps the markets themselves don't make a lot of money. But the advantage of the small quoted companies, the ability to grow when the world's not growing, the immature nature of their businesses, the ability to make acquisitions from the receiver will keep them going. And I think they will continue to generate very attractive returns in, irrespective of those features. Thank you, Glenn, for response. I really appreciate it. Now, I want to ask a slightly different question, if I may. I want to ask you, Gervais, about your personal investing style away from Premier Might. And what's your investing style for your own ISA slash SIP if you own any of those things? What do you do differently? Yes, of course, I, I do. Own own I mean, I'm afraid it's terribly simple. Um, apart from a, a shareholding in Premier Mighton, which came from the Mighton PLC uh, uh, business, um, I put all my capital into um, my own funds. Um, uh, Good. If, it perform, <laughs> if, if it doesn't perform, you could give actually. If it doesn't perform, I know why it doesn't perform. <laughs> <laughs> but most particularly, ultimately, you know, I think Martin and I and some of the other teams at, at Premier Mighton are well positioned for the future. And so, from that point of view, I think the environment's good. I think the opportunities there, they have been out of fashion somewhat uh, with Brexit and uncertainty about global growth, uh, which has led to uh, perhaps uh, anxiety about uh, small quota companies and share price terms. So ultimately, uh, the risk reward ratio, uh, from my, my point of view, is one which I feel comfortable with. And therefore, uh, uh, it's very easy for me to back that. Brilliant. Now, I've got a final question for you, if I may. Now, without giving away the secret sauce, um, what would you say has enabled you to have such a successful and expanded longevity since 1985 as a fund manager? What's been your secret to your success, Gervais? Well, what I think is quite interesting is that um, I think we can all be a little bit purist in certain things. And you think, well, you know, the market's wrong on this area and it's going to come right in time. And that might be right. But ultimately, um, if you don't deliver returns to your clients over a three or a five year period, then you won't have any clients. So at the end of the day, whatever I think about you know, long term or opportunities, the main focus has been the relentless uh, sort of desire to deliver an attractive return, a good client outcome, irrespective of the market clients. And you know, as I say, for the last 30 years, I think we've been in a period where I think uh, asset prices have risen, small companies have been out of fashion, UK assets have been out of fashion. Uh, we still had to find a way to make some very attractive returns so that clients can justify holding our funds, even at a time when NASDAQ's doing incredibly well, uh, long, long dated bonds are outperforming, private equity funds have done incredibly well. We've got to de deliver an attractive return irrespective. So that's the first thing. We, we found a way to deliver an attractive return, even in conditions which haven't entirely suited us. I, I, as you probably realize, I'm much more cautious than most investors. A lot of the ratios in my funds, the betas and things are, are, are subnormal, which means that really I should have, my clients should have had a very big bad outcome in the last 10 or 20 years, but, but we, they haven't because we found ways to live a value. So that's the first thing. The second thing, which I think is overwhelmingly important, I think all fund managers uh, uh, you know, need to take this, uh, this, this priority uh, right up there, is you need to be very clear and, 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 and engaging as best you can about the nature of the risks which you need to take on behalf of your clients to generate a return. Uh, as we all know, if you take no risk, you won't generate a return. Right? So it is it, we need to take risks on, on, on behalf of our clients. That does mean some things don't always turn out well. Sometimes things take longer to come through, all the rest of it. You've got to be as best you can really helpful and giving clients a really good understanding of the nature of the risks you're, you're happy to take. And in our case, perhaps we're happy to get involved in more smallness than many others, not just mid caps and small caps, but micro caps as well. Perhaps we're, like, we're willing to go across a wider range of different industry sectors to diversify our risk, but perhaps getting involved in sectors such as energy, such as mining, such as complicated financials to diversify risk and generate more upside because there's more risk involved. But ultimately, you've got to be very, very clear and prioritize that communication as well as ultimately the long term delivery. And I think it's those two 
side by side, which ultimately we believe uh, is absolutely essential, not just to be successful, but to continue to have a client base so that you're successful in the future. Fantastic reply to your face. As always, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, and you're always so thorough in your response. And I, and I just love the fact that you're constantly on the, in, on and in the market sharing your your um, 30 plus years of wisdom. So I really appreciate you taking the time speaking with, with myself on um, on the Investing Matters podcast. That was well, I mean, people, I mean, use... you know, the Sorry. same goes for you. I mean, you know, in a way, you're in a more difficult position for me. You know, you, don't, you haven't got necessarily the, the, the large business behind you and all the other things. So, I, 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 you know, I, I think it's it's terrific, not just what you do, but but, but many uh, these different perceptions, which all come together to help people become engaged and informed and thought for and, and 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 hopefully making good decisions and so in a way i i think you know my job's easy compared with your job I, i'm more impressed by what you've done than what i've achieved oh that's so kind of you so very very kind of you uh, for me Gervais, the, the beauty of what you do and, and i do and other people do is about sharing it's about education and we're trying to enable as many people as we possibly can at, on you know that listen to the investing matters podcast and other podcasts and other things i do to become almost independent, you know, they can choose the right fund manager, they can choose the right stock. And this is what we're trying to do on these podcasts is try and enable people to learn and to improve and to get better, you know, because we all want to get to a place where we're financially secure. And I think given all the noise we're hearing right now, people are going to have more and more pressures to actually secure that yeah. going forward. Yeah. No, I, I wholly agree. I think, I think, um, you know, I think the challenges are, are quite significant out there. Um, unfortunately, that probably means some of the risks which people are taking will kind of turn out badly, perhaps more than usual. Um, and, and indeed, the, the, the importance of generating some cash and having a, 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 a nest egg for the future is probably going to be more important than it was previously. Yeah, so, so if anything, the risk reward ratio has got a little harder. And so anything we can do collectively with you and me and other people like us is terrifically important. Amanda. Brilliant. No, I completely agree. Thank you very much. Now, that was author, fund manager and head of equities at Premier Mighton. Gervais Williams. Gervais, thank you ever so much. Take care. God bless. And all to your continued success and the team's success as well at Premier Mighton. Take care. God bless. Thank you very much, Peter. I really enjoyed it.